Since creating the detective Sherlock Holmes, writer Conan Doyle has been continuously asked to solve cases, clear injustices. All were turned down by him, except for the case of George Adalji. In 1907, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was sitting at his desk when his secretary brought a bulky package. Inside was a letter from a former prisoner and a stack of newspaper clippings. It wasn't hard to guess what the man wanted. The letter was from George Adalji. The more Conan Doyle read, the more intrigued he became. He quickly made a decision. Though not trained to be a detective, he would shed light on George's case. Ultimately, this would be the only real-life investigation Conan Doyle ever directly participated in, following leads, interviewing witnesses, even confronting the police and lobbying the government. George Adalji, born in 1876, was of mixed heritage, his mother English and his father Indian. They moved from Bombay to the all-white village of Great Wyerley, Staffordshire. His father became England's first South Asian vicar. In 1888, when George started at grammar school, the family began receiving anonymous hate mail, even having windows broken and dung thrown into their home. George became a lawyer in Birmingham, commuting back home by train every evening to live with his parents. In February 1903, Great Wyerley was gripped with horror as a horse's mutilated body was found in a field. Over the next four months, three more horses, three cows, and a sheep were found dead. Each case followed a pattern. Under cover of night, the perpetrator would stab the animals and leave them to die. Despite deploying 20 policemen for regular patrols, no leads were found. Anonymous letters were sent to the chief constable, threatening to do the same to 20 village maidens. Debbie Timlock called the police hotline but died before they arrived at her home, raped and fatally wounded. As fear engulfed the village, rumors began to spread. Anonymous letters began to appear, all pointing fingers at George, suggesting he was part of a gang and detailing how he mutilated animals. Around 8 p.m. on August 17th of the same year, another horse was killed, less than a kilometer from George's home. Early the next morning, police raided George's parents' home, seizing a pair of muddy boots and an old coat. When they claimed to find horsehair on the coat, George's father brought it to the window for closer inspection. He pointed out it was actually a thread. My son didn't leave the house last night, he declared. But George was immediately arrested at his law office, denied bail due to the large sum. Four days later, as George remained huddled in the police station's dark cell, another horse was killed in the village using the same modus operandi. This seemed like it would exonerate George, but it didn't. At the trial in October, the prosecutor claimed George refused bail because his gang would strike again to mislead the police. Police claimed to have collected 29 horsehairs from George's coat and found stains that could be blood. Evidence was never presented in court. Police also said they discovered footprints matching George's on the field where the horse was killed. George was convicted of maliciously injuring a horse and sending threatening letters to a police officer he had never heard of. He was sentenced to seven years hard labor. A few weeks later, his father began collecting signatures for a petition to the home office, seeking his son's freedom. He said the evidence was entirely fabricated, and even after the trial, horse killings continued. The case drew public attention, with leading British lawyers casting doubt on the miscarriage of justice. At that time, Britain had no court of appeal, so detailed appeals and various petitions were sent to the Home Office, which forwarded them to George Anson, the chief constable of Staffordshire. But George Anson was disdainful, dismissing them. But the case continued to attract attention. Three years into his imprisonment, George was released but remained under supervision, barred from practicing law. While in prison, George read Conan Doyle's detective novel, The Hound of the Baskervilles. He quickly became an avid fan of Sherlock Holmes. In desperation, upon his release, George wrote a plea to Arthur Conan Doyle, along with a large box of articles about his case. Conan Doyle arranged to meet George at a hotel in London and with his keen observation, he immediately knew the man sitting opposite couldn't be the culprit. George handed me the menu with difficulty and slightly cocked to one side indicating not only severe nearsightedness but also a distinct squint. The idea of a man like that wandering around at night and attacking livestock while evading the police was absurd, Conan Doyle later wrote. Conan Doyle's courteous demeanor, direct speaking style, filled George with hope. He returned to his home with a lighter heart. Conan Doyle's first step was to arrange for an independent examination of George's eyesight to prove that he was nearly blind. In January 1907, he visited Great Wyerley Village, having breakfast with George's family. Conan Doyle switched on Sherlock Holmes mode and proceeded to the grassy fields, the crime scenes. 
Struggling through thorny brambles, he silently thought, there was no way a, blind as a bat, men like George could move on a dark rainy night. He knelt on the field and observed that the soil was bright red, unlike the sandy soil found on George's boots. Conan Doyle then met the police chief, who was very proud to have the famous writer visit. But the officer still insisted George was the culprit, largely based on prejudiced assumptions about his skin color and Indian heritage. The meeting made Conan Doyle realize that police chief George Anson was a racist who had targeted George for years. On the train ride back, he thought about the elderly vicar couple, their blind son unjustly convicted, and the arrogant police officer. Then he began writing. George Edalgi's case was written in two parts in January 1907 and published worldwide. Conan Doyle refused to accept any reward. The articles turned George Edalgi into an almost instant celebrity. In true Sherlock Holmes fashion, Conan Doyle examined every argument presented by the prosecution and refuted it. Apart from the external evidence, George's eyesight, the prejudices of the police chief, the lack of real evidence, the writer resurrected details about the blood-stained boots, according to the police. According to Conan Doyle, if George had indeed butchered a horse, would his boots only have two dried blood drops and the overcoat be clean? What about the 29 horsehairs on the clothing? If it was real horsehair, the police should have immediately taken samples and sealed them in an envelope to preserve the evidence. But they did nothing, he pointed out. A piece of horse skin from the dead horse was even brought to the police station. Why was it so difficult to get the horsehair stuck on the suspect's coat? Moreover, the footprints believed to be George's were not taken, and they were not photographed. Conan Doyle declared, Every piece of evidence the police have will crumble into pieces when you touch it. And in his impassioned conclusion, he proclaimed, Racial prejudice within the police and judiciary system has led to a miscarriage of justice. Readers in England responded by sending hundreds of letters to the Home Office. Under increasing pressure, the final Home Secretary announced an inquiry commission. After review, they reported George innocent of horse slaying, but certain that no compensation for wrongful imprisonment was due. Supporters of George received this news with indignation. The Home Office made no further response. Furious, Conan Doyle continued working day and night on the case. He wrote articles and letters to newspapers, conducted interviews, and gathered more information. He also enlisted a highly respected handwriting expert to re-examine the anonymous letters, revealing that the handwriting did not match George's. Conan Doyle decided to personally pursue the murderer. Early evidence pointed to the suspect, Royden Sharp, a fellow student who had publicly mocked and bullied George. Royden consistently ranked at the bottom of the class and had two previous convictions for railway vandalism. Most notably, Royden's handwriting matched the anonymous letters that had plagued George's family in 1888 and the letter sent to the police chief, threatening harm to 20 girls. This young man was eventually expelled for forgery and impersonating the headmaster's handwriting. He later became a butcher. Conan Doyle noted that the wounds on the horse corpses were inflicted by a circular-edged tool, similar to Royden's butchering tools. He sent his findings to the police chief. In response, the police chief sent a letter stating, I don't need you to teach me how to solve crimes. Your investigation is mere speculation. I have no reason to convict Royden. In response to this move, Conan Doyle sent all of these fiercely worded letters to the newspapers. Faced with public outcry, the Law Society reinstated George's profession. We hope you found the video informative and intriguing. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more updates on this case and other fascinating stories. Your support helps us continue our investigations and bring closure to these mysteries. Thank you for watching.